and good morning and welcome to the ninth annual and 14th speaker of the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Alumni Series. Uh, my name is Clint Rapphole. I am pleased to let you know that I have been here 36 years at the Conrad N. Hilton College of Hotel and Restaurant Management and the University of Houston. I am a professor emeritus. Uh, e stands to go. Emeritus stands for deserves. You put the two together. Emeritus deserves to go. How about that? This program would not be as successful as it is without the help of two people in particular. And Wendy Gary, I'm not sure she's here, but she has worked with me for close to, I think, 12 years and does an outstanding job. And, and frankly, without her, I would really be in trouble. And the other person that helps immensely is Shannon Burnett. So I would like to give both of them a, a round of applause. <laughs> very briefly, there are a few other people I'd like to recognize that are back with us. Uh, we're very fortunate to have John and Joan Beers. Uh, John is a former Air Kilton Distinguished Chair Lecturer, as is Mr. Marty Breverman, and some of you may have heard him previously this morning. Mr. Nick Massad is with us. Uh, Mr. Charles Warzak and his wife Lorenda, Dorothy Nicholson, and Mr. Greg Rocket. We also have another person in our, in our midst and alumnus, uh, Mr. Robert Ralston. How many of you are working Gourmet Night? Mr. Ralston was the general manager for the first Gourmet Night and the second Gourmet Night. And he will be with us this coming Saturday and we're, looking, we're all looking forward to it. I'd like to remind the students and anyone else in this room that at 2 o'clock there's a seminar in Barron's where you can meet up close and personal Mr. Joseph Jackson and his wife Suzanne. Also participating in this informal seminar will be Mr. Uh, Charles Warzak and his wife Lorinda, uh, Mr. John Beers and his wife Joan, Mr. Greg Rocket, and if Mr. Breverman finds time he may stop by to say hello because he's already worked very hard today. <laughs> Refreshments will also be served and we look forward to seeing you all there. At this time I would like to turn the program over to Dorothy Nicholson, a 1977 graduate of our college and chairperson of Eric's Club. Thank you Dr. Rapol, Professor Emeritus, but he just <coughs> won't go. <laughs> Um, my uh, function as chairman uh, is to tell you a little bit about endowed chairs to explain this concept to you. In 1982, the Hilton Foundation granted our college over $21 million to be used over a 10-year period. Now part of that, part of those funds helped to build this wing where we have extra, where we had extra classrooms, laboratory, the library, offices. It was a tremendous addition to the college. It also provided for four endowed uh, chairs, the first of which is uh, Conrad Hilton Endowed Chair, which is currently held by Dr. Ron Nykiel, the Baron Hilton Endowed Chair, which is held by Dr. John Bowen, who is our dean, the Eric Hilton Endowed Chair was formerly occupied by Dr. Rapole. And there was the Don Hubbs Professorship. Mr. Hubbs was the uh, head of the Hilton Foundation at the time. And that professorship is occupied by Dr. Stowe Shoemaker. Their uh, funds were also provided for a development officer, which is uh, Mr. John Schultz. And uh, since then, we have had many other funds that have provided endowments and professorships, one of which was the Specs Charitable Foundation Professorship, which is occupied by Dr. Jana, Jana Abbott. Uh, recently, the uh, Carlson Endowed Fellow was provided, and that is held by Mr. Tom Latton. And then also, there is the Clinton Rapol Endowed Chair, which is currently occupied by Dr. Carl Boger. So this is quite an honor, and uh, it, it's, it really elevates the stature of our college. An endowed chair 
assist the college in recruiting outstanding faculty and it provides the opportunity to develop a standard of excellence for our college. And not that anybody is counting, but it sort of keeps score with other colleges, other hotel colleges, and how we measure up with them. An endowed chair provides for salary, benefits, travel, secretarial assi assistance, and graduate assistance. At the University of Houston, an endowed chair starts at $1 million. Now what does this mean to you as a student? We are very fortunate to have so many endowments and chairs that ensure the level of education, the best education that we can provide for you. It was my honor to initiate the Clinton L. Rapole Endowed Chair, which was then further funded by and contributed to other alumni and I hope and assume that one day you will also be one of those alumni. As a future alumni, it will be up to you to continue the prominence of the Hilton College by excelling in your career and by exemplifying the standard of education provided to you and ensuring the tradition of greatness by supporting your alma mater in the future. Our members of Eric's Club former distinguished lecturers, are grateful for the opportunity to come back and share our experiences with you. And we hope that you will someday be doing the same thing. We're grateful that the Eric Hilton Endowed Chair has made this opportunity possible for us. And without further ado, to introduce your next distinguished alumni lecturer, Mr. John Beers, who was our fall of 07 lecturer. Thank you, Dorothy, Dean Bowen, and Dr. Rapole. It's truly a priv privilege to be here today and to have the opportunity to introduce Mr. Joseph Jackson, the 14th Eric Hilton Distinguished Lecturer. Joseph is a 30-year veteran of the restaurant industry and a 1977 graduate of the Conrad School. Uh, he is no stranger to this college as he serves on the Conrad Hilton School of Hospitality Management Board of Advisors. He recently received the prestigious Founding Dean's Award for, the, for this college and was a commencement speaker for the spring semester of 2004. Joseph is a prime example of how hard work and dedication, as well as exemplary business performance, can lead to a successful career with a major corporation. His career path took him through various general manager positions with steak and ale, Bennigan's restaurants and Olive Garden restaurants. He continued honing his management skills by owning an Outback Steakhouse in San Antonio. In 1999, Joseph got the call and was promoted to vice president for OSI restaurants and OSI partners in Tampa. His primary job responsibilities involve handling diversity issues within the areas of human resource management management training, mentoring, and restaurant ownership. He also spends a great deal of time building OSI's minority customer base through multicultural business promotions across the country, utilizing such vehicles as the NAACP, women's organizations, and local Hispanic groups. Furthering his duties, Joseph spends time cultivating work relationships with minority and women-owned purveyors or suppliers for the OSI restaurant chain. One of Joseph's many corporate initiatives has been the development of a program called Five for Our Future. The purpose of the program is to provide needed mentorship and career development for women and minorities throughout all OSI restaurants. This issue carries such high level of importance within the company that the president, all vice presidents, and area owners take extreme ownership in this program. And finally, Joseph works regularly with the legal and marketing departments to protect the restaurant brands while promoting sales among all nationalities. Success within the corporation and the community 
has yielded Joseph a multitude of awards. Most notably, he has been awarded the Outbacker of the Year at the annual Partners Conference where he and his wife, Suzanne, were rewarded with a trip to <coughs> Australia and New Zealand. While living in Tampa, Joseph has also been the recipient of some local, 60 local recognition awards. Volunteering is also high on Joseph's priority list as he is a member of many boards such as the University of Houston Hilton School of Hospitality Management, Hospitality Initiatives Diversity Institute of Texas, Multicultural Food Service and Hospitality Alliance, the Florida Aquarium, United Negro College Fund, African American Advisory Board at University of South Florida, Leadership Florida, and Community of Tampa Bay. With all these obligations and the demands of a corporate officer, it's hard to see how Joseph has much time <laughs> to do anything outside his job and community activities. But he loves to spend time with his wife, Suzanne, their two daughters, and granddaughter. He also enjoys playing golf and working in the gardens around his Tampa home. With all this said, please join me in welcoming a fellow Hilton College graduate and the 14th Eric Hilton Distinguished Lecturer, Mr. Joseph Jackson. I just need to make sure the mic is on, and it is. I am so amazed to see so many people here. You thought it was Barack Obama, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Didn't you? Nah, come on, tell me. Not true, not true. Um, you know, I wanted to spend some time in the back area um, because that's where I was when I was a student for the most part. I always sat in the back, and um, when sitting in the back, it all gave me a very good perspective. First of all, I had to learn how to identify people by the backs of their heads because that's, you never saw their faces. And the other thing, I always have a Dr. Rapole story that I have to tell. Believe it or not, Dr. Rapole has not changed in the way he looked in, these, in this whole 30 years. He looks exactly the same way, just like a 29-year-old with gray hair. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because I just want to make sure my degree is always safe and they'll never take it from me. But, but I remember, now this is, now, if now that he's an emeritus, you know, you can tell all these real stories. I used to work at the Hyatt Regency downtown in, um, in Houston, and I did night audit and reception, which means I went to work at 7, 7, 11 o'clock at night and uh, I got, uh, got back at um, 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, I'd have classes, and I took a full load, either 15 to 18 hours all the time. And I remember some of my one, of my, one of my classes was with Dr. Rapole, and I sat in the stop, obviously in the back, and I would have a tape recorder, because I know that my eyes would close because of being sleepy. And I can tell you that Dr. Rapole would turn on the tape recorder for me because he knew how important it was for me to graduate. And I just want to thank you because, to me, that's a special person. That's a special person. So if you can just give a round of applause to my friend. Thank you for I appreciate that. OK. I want to have a little fun today, and I want to tell you about my life, OK? And it's kind of like a first time I've ever done anything like this because the perspective, uh oh, I knew I was going to do that at the beginning. The perspective I have is always doing things and never looking back. So this is a time for me to look back at my life. And it all started here. It all started with this college. I want to thank a few people that are here today. Um, my wife, Suzanne, her cousin, Claudia, who's right next to her. I call her Foxy Brown is what we call her. <laughs> Show them why you're foxy. No. <laughs> you know, um, I was in the Air Force. Um, well, I graduated. I went to, excuse me, I was born in Galveston, Texas. Okay? Yay! Got some. And then we moved across the bay to a little town called Buttermilk Junction, Texas. Anybody know where that is? <coughs> Buttermilk Junction, Texas. You always win the smallest town. Uh, war, when you know somebody says from a small town, you say you're from Butterbilt Junction, people go, oh, that's that small. <laughs> and anyway, they changed it to Lamarck, Texas, right? Anybody here from Lamarck, Texas? Few got out. Good, good, good. He's not very proud of it, but that's okay. Um, 
And then um, I had a chance to um, go to College of the Mainland. Anybody know what College of the Mainland is? A community college? Ah, my wife graduated from there. Same guy. <laughs> you following me? What's the deal? Um, so from there, um, I, was, I was drafted in the military. Okay? It was during the war, and that during that time you had numbers. And the number was based on your birthday. And I was, I was born on August 2nd, so I, my number was three. Three. So if there, I couldn't leave the county unless I told the people in the induction office. So the day I graduated from College of the Mainland, the next day I was drafted into the Army. Okay? But because I was such a smart kid, I decided I'd go in the Air Force instead. So instead of spending a year and 18 months in the Army, I spent four years in the Air Force. So this is going to be a lot about sometimes you think the right decision is the right decision. Until you make the decision, then you go, what was I thinking? <laughs> and then um, I was sitting, I remember sitting in, the, um, uh, in Izmir, Turkey, because I was stationed in Turkey. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, I was sitting in Turkey. And what happened was I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to be going back to the States, and I need to get a college education, I believe. And so there was nine different colleges that I applied for to be able to get the catalogs. The only people to send me a catalog <laughs> was the Conrad N. Hilton School of Hotel and Restaurant Management. And I said, oh, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and I decided this would be a good thing to do. So for six months, how bad could it be? <laughs> well, it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good. OK, it's got to get serious now. Sorry. <laughs> excellence. We're going to talk about the excellence within you. In excellence, I define an excellence as a feature of distinction or quality of being outstanding. And in business, it is the excellence in you that you are the obvious choice. So whenever you think about what, when someone gets promoted, the reason why people get promoted is because they are what? The obvious choice, right? And you guys can sing along anytime I say anything, OK? It's good with me. Your beliefs in how to understand that excellence within you is I'm going to try to go through that piece, and then we're going to talk about my history and then some other things. I want you to understand one, one concept that's been important to me, that your, your future begins every single day. From you or who you are because of everything you did in the past, and everything you do today in the future also <coughs> creates the future that you really want. So what I want you to do is to kind of imagine. Imagine me being your age. I know that's a stretch. <laughs> okay, But there was a time, myself, Dr. Rapone, Dr. Faye Jackson, we were all your age. Okay, Boy, that, did you look stunned? <laughs> is that hard to believe? Well, let me show you a picture of when I was your age. You guys ready? <laughs> <laughs> That picture, right there in the middle. Well, the one on the side is the most beautiful baby in the free world. Would you imagine? <laughs> That's right. That was, that was me. And I don't remember that very much because I was probably nine months. Well, actually, I was nine months. Here, 19 years old. I was president of the student body of College of the Mainland. Wonderful thing. This last picture is kind of strange, isn't it? You know, anybody who got through the 70s and 80s, you just need to hug them. Because that was... That was a tough time. We really didn't know each other. We didn't know ourselves. But we finally decided, and from my mind, that a lot of hair in a strange outfit, <laughs> which is called a daishiki, and actually one of my employees from uh, the Ivory Coast brought that to me. And if you notice, the embroidery is gold, real gold. So if you go on eBay today, you can find that same thing. <laughs> My lovely wife, Suzanne Jackson, we've been married for 36 years. <laughs> we, we sign a contract every seven years. I got to make sure the math is right. We just signed a contract. And um, actually, it's not a real contract. It's just she decides to, she's not going to change the keys to the house. And my kids, OK, they're a lot older than this. But those are my favorite pictures of my kids, Marissa, Lauren, and Guylan, Amiri Jackson. That's Guylan. Notice the hair. You know, when you get a little older, your hair leaves. Actually, that's uh, Guylan and my, uh, my granddaughter, Sarah Nicole. Okay? No. 
And that's Marissa when she was a model here in the state of Texas. She's so beautiful, I always wondered who was the father. Uh, <laughs> Now, you'll notice that that's Sarah Nicole with this guy. And as you notice, he's a little different than everybody else you've seen. <laughs> that's because he's from Missouri. <laughs> Thought they would work better than it did, but it's good enough. <laughs> uh, my daughter actually eloped, OK? She just eloped um, a year ago, I guess it was. I, I, it's, Please don't do that to your daddy. I mean, please don't do that. I mean, we don't see you enough. We work in the industry. We work all this time. And, and then your daughter calls you up and, Daddy, I got some news. <laughs> what is it, sweetheart? I got married. <laughs> well, anyway, she's happy. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got to break this. On a serious note, one of the uh, events that I had a job opportunity to do a couple of years ago was at the National Civil Rights Museum. And this is the Lorraine Hotel. Okay, and I know you've heard about it over the last few days because uh, if you look where the reef is on the second uh, balcony, in that room is where Martin Luther King Jr. stayed his last night. Uh, that, uh, that next day at 6.01 uh, p.m. Uh, while going to, about to go to a dinner with some friends, he was uh, assassinated. Um, that day is something that anybody in my age will never forget what you were doing during that time period. It means a lot to me to be able to see the banner of my company, to be able to support something like this. And uh, here's some, some people. Myself, uh, anybody know that guy in the middle? Judge Joe Brown, Judge Joe Brown right? <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she never skips class to look at Judge Joe Brown. Right? It never happened. <laughs> TiVo, right? It's TiVo. TiVo, OK? And then PJ Benton and uh, Sid Levy, who are, are, are franchise owners for Outback Steakhouse. <coughs> One of my proudest moments ever okay, was coming back to my alma mater and, and delivering the keynote address. Oh, my god. An honor. I, I was in a convention with, um, with about 1,700 of my peers, and my, my supervisor, my boss, brought that up. And he said, who here has ever been the commencement speaker at their <laughs> college or university? And out of this group of prestigious people, no one raised their hand. And he said, that's because you're not as good as Joseph Jackson. And that brought a tear to my eye. He didn't give me a raise, but it brought a tear <laughs> to my eye. Now, if you look at, you know, we, um, when, we, when I was introduced, we talked about the, uh, going to Australia. And that's actually in a zoo in Australia. Um, my wife, of course, uh, myself. Do I look petrified? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's a rat. <laughs> and also, we had a chance to sail on the um, uh, Sydney Harbor, OK, in that particular boat. So we took a picture there. And we were very happy to be alive. And it's a wonderful life we've had. I've got here, not because of my beings, but because of a few great people in my life. First of all, I want to say that my mom and dad, my mom had a third grade education. My father had an uh, 11th grade education. That's all they had. And in the traditional sense, you would think that that couldn't give rise to encouragement and to dedication and pride. Um, the way it did for me. And the reason is because we don't think that people can articulate those values when, they're, when all they have is that amount of education. But I can tell you that I never knew my mom had only a third grade education because every night she would spend time with me at the dinner table um, and we would, I would do my homework. And if it was biology or trigonometry or whatever it was, whatever the discipline, she would be there with me. And I was not an A student, I can tell you that. And I miss her. And I miss my dad also. My dad was a very short person. I hate to say that, but he was 5'1". I'm 6'6". Six, six. My mom's 5'2". <laughs> <laughs> I 
There's a tribe of Indians called Karankawa Indians that are in the, the uh, sea coast of, of the Gulf Coast of uh, Texas. They're all seven feet tall. I didn't know anything about it until my son wanted to know about his roots. And we knew his name. We went to the library and found that out. So I was very, after taking chemistry, excuse me, biology, I was very fortunate to know that the postman probably was not my father. <laughs> my, fa my grandfather was named by the name of Mr. Waddy. That's what we called him, Mr. Waddy. And Mr. Whitey was an encourager. And his, his whole part of my life is he always told me that you'd be, you'll be successful one day if you just believe it. Saul Colton. If you've ever been in Galveston on the far end of East, of East Beach, you'll see a place called the Treasure Isle Motor Hotel. It looks pretty bad now. But back in the day, it was one of the prominent places to go to, um, for people to vacation in Galveston. Saul Colton was the person who gave me my first start in this job. I had to drive. I had to take a bus in the morning to get to this hotel from from Lamont, Texas, it took me forever, and Saul would be there waiting for me, and he would give me about a thousand things to do, and I, and I did all that for 63 cents an hour. And he made me think I was making a million dollars. We already talked about Dr. Rapol, but there's another special person in my life by the name of Mrs. Washington, excuse me, Mrs. Washington, Deborah Washington. When I was growing up, I had some vision problems. I, had a, had a, I was a stutterer. And um, she took three years out of her life, three years out of her life after school to spend with me to help me grow and develop to the point where I was only being passed because they needed to chair to the part of being, uh, graduating or, or leaving that school within the top, being in one of the top five students. And finally, I have a faith in believing that, I'm, that I really matter to something greater than anyone here that I meet in this life, and that's very important to me. This is the first time I had a chance to share my whole life with anybody. I didn't think anybody would care. And I'm sure the jury is still out. <laughs> what did I do here? It's, um, I understand that honest sharing is cathartic, meaning that it's therapeutic, right? So we'll see for me. If I'm, if I'm good, if I feel good about it, I'll be fine. If I start crying, give me a tissue. And, but I, I want you to benefit from my experiences, and then there is going to be some learning, I, I would imagine, in here. And we're going to go through these pretty quick. Hi, Regency Hotel. That's where I, that's why I, uh, I started off. It was a night auditor reception. Uh, I remember one night, uh, and I know there's a night auditor up here, uh, we had a double booking of a hotel of about 700 people. Hi, <coughs> Regency had like 900 people, not excuse me, 900 rooms. And so somebody got fired, because you just don't put 700 people out in the street. So they promoted me to lead night audit and reception, which was a wonderful thing. So it taught me one thing to be prepared. When I graduated from this school, you'd be amazed to know that I went to Jack in the Box restaurants. And you know why? Because they paid more money than anybody else. And within two and a half months, I was the regional director of training. So I figured, boy, I really got prepared at the school. <laughs> and it was amazing, too, because I had never even I couldn't believe that I could do so well in fast food, but then it wasn't a challenge for me. So someone said, you need to go in a full-service restaurant. So I decided to go to Steak and Ale. And Steak and Ale was a wonderful experience for me. I went from trainee, and I'll let you know what it went to general, general manager. Um, uh, Steak and Ale is, um, 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 you know, Chili's Corporation uh, owns them now, and um, actually it's Brinker Corporation. And for me, that was a good training ground. The first person I ever worked for was a woman. Um, her name is Claire Charlton, and uh, Claire taught me w one thing that I'll never forget. She was beautiful. She had blonde hair. She had blue eyes. She was very thin. She was lovely. And when she blinked her eyes, everybody jumped and did what she wanted to do. As you saw that previous picture with me in the daishiki, I had none of those qualities, okay? So I had to figure out how to do things on my own, but Claire taught me this one thing. If you get to know your people, and you get to know them as individuals, they'll do anything for you. And that was the only little lesson she taught me that I can remember, and it was the most beneficial one. Being, you know, going to our finance classes here, I understand that corporate mergers are the way to be able to make money. You need to be in the right place at the right time. So I decided to go to Fuddruckers, because Fuddruckers was this new, exciting hamburger company that was going to go all over the United States, and I was working in Steak and Ale, and Steak and Ale was going to buy Fuddruckers, so I said, let me go to Fuddruckers, right? So I left Steak and Ale, left a good job there, went to Fuddruckers, lasted about six months. 
is the worst run company I've ever worked for. If you work for Fud Records, I am so sorry, but you need to leave. <laughs> and another winning proposition that no longer exists in my mind is Gerber's Restaurant Supplies. I did sales, in and out sales, in and, um, sales inside and out, which means I was at the counter, I went out to the restaurants and hotels. I left them and went to work for Documenter. Documenter was a point of sale system. Uh, if you can remember this big orange monster that used to sit on top of the, the counters at Burger King, most of, basically that's what those are. The Mr. W Company, you ever heard of Mr. W? Now you've, everybody's seen it because usually during the 4th of July you'll see these firework stands and then it has this big W on it. You go, what the hell is that? Well, that's Mr. W Company. He has like 17,000 outlets. He makes a lot of money and he had a restaurant equipment and supply place. And while I'm talking about this, I need you all to make me a promise that you're going to go to a person who the only good thing out of working for Mr. W Company was the fact that I met a person by the name of Mr. Hank Wiggins. And Hank Wiggins owns Hank's Ice Cream. Hank's Ice Cream is on South Main. And if you've never been to Hank's Ice Cream, what have you been eating? <laughs> it is the, first of all, it is an entrepreneur. He, he came to me. He said he was a cab driver. One of his cab, um, he was, he owns five cabs. One of his cab drivers was tragically killed. And, and he wanted to get out of the business. So he walked up to me when I was in this W place and he said, I want to start an ice cream business. And I'm like, well, okay, tell me what you're going to do. And he told me, I have this recipe. I think it's pretty good. Have you ever worked in a restaurant? No. Hank Ice Cream is one of the most successful stories of ice cream here in the Houston area. Um, and <coughs> what I want you to do is you've got to promise me that you're going to go and you're going to say hi to Mr. Hank himself. Okay? And you, that's the best ice cream you've ever had, okay? And it's on South Main by the uh, Reliance Stadium in that area, okay? Everybody going? Tell him I told him it was free. No. <laughs> well, I missed the business a whole lot, and I decided to come to Bennigan's. And coming to Bennigan's, it was a wonderful experience, um, but we went from the transition of having fresh food to frozen food, and... I think that does something to the mental state of the people who work, who make those decisions. So it was the worst decision I ever saw. Then I went to go work for Olive Garden. Uh, Olive Garden was fun. Outback Steakhouse. <laughs> I worked for I worked for uh, Olive Garden in um, in San Antonio, Texas. And one of the things that taught me a lot about is to be able to to um, understand that in a corporate setting, uh, everything has to be done a certain way, but you have to think a certain way. And when you think a certain way, that's how you get, um, you get promoted. And that's okay, because a lot of times people want to have that, 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 um, that bureaucracy. And, and there's nothing really wrong with that. But I'm, I'm a free thinker. I, I, I just don't, I, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't do that for a long time. Very successful. When I left that company, all, every outback in the country was down 9%. I was up 12% in sales. So I did a really good job. But my son actually was working for Outback Steakhouse. And in Outback Steakhouse, uh, a lot of the people that I worked with with Steak and Air before were working there. But it was this one thing that was a lot that was missing from my life, and it's called entrepreneurship. And owning your something, owning your something is the most <coughs> important thing you ever do. It changed my life. You know, when I worked for Olive Garden, and they would say, you treat this as just though if you owned it. Well, I think this, this wall needs to be painted. No, you can't do that. Okay? Well, you know, I think my people may need one more day of training. No, you know, if they can't get it done in 18 hours, you need to fire. So I, I own this place, right? No, you don't own anything. So when I went to Outback Steakhouse, it changed me because I was an owner. And it changed me in, in a number of ways. First of all, when you're truly responsible for the lives of young people, in your mind, you become a different person. <laughs> Everything that was always important to you becomes even more important. All the responsibility that you have for the caring of these young people amplifies. And you know that every time somebody breaks a dish, you don't applaud and say bravo or whatever people say these days. You lose money. And we, Susie Ann and I went from being poor people to, I don't know, because she keeps the books. I have no idea. No idea. One of the things I did is I volunteered for something. And I never really liked to volunteer for anything, okay? So I volunteered to be, to, uh, to do a diversity class. 
and it led to my position today. So if you have a specific talent, always use it. Fire for the future. We already talked about that, but I want to just emphasize that. One of the things that's going to make you great is understanding the fact that the level playing field that we believe is in our industry or any industry isn't necessarily there. There's still a good old boys network out there. And what we want to do, if we want to do is we want to interrupt that system. And the way you interrupt that system is that you make sure that everybody has, a, has an ability to participate in what the American dream is all about. And the American dream is not one big pie that we all fight over the crumbs over. Think about this for a second. American dream is the fact that we have mopies. Everybody say mopies. See, because if I have a small piece of pie and we're all fighting over those crumbs, what's going to happen? When I turn my back, you're going to steal some of those crumbs, aren't you? But if I have a pie, she has a pie, we make more pies, that's a good thing. American dream, more pies. Very sophisticated, wasn't it? <laughs> Talking fast. I'm going to skip over this. Can you guys read it real quick? You guys are college students? Yes? Got it? Good. I want you all to say these following words. We do what we do to get what we need. One more time. One more time. No, no, say it with conviction this time. My wife hates when I tell the story, but but you guys know who Beyonce knows is? <laughs> And, and you know, one of the things about Beyonce knows is that she's beautiful. Oh my God. And she's from Houston. And I'm pretty sure when we were, we've probably seen her at Shape Community Center where we did some volunteer work. But anyway, <clears throat> she, she just married this little short guy by the name of Jay-Z, right? Right? Okay. And why, so what does it have to do with what I'm talking about? Let me tell you why. Okay. I like Beyonce knows. I mean, my wife knows that. And she told me, if you ever got Beyonce knows, I would be so happy because I could tell everybody, look what I trained. <laughs> <laughs> and she's also, a, she's also a realist. That will never happen, right? But anyway, if I did what I did to get what I need, I would pretty well slap Jay-Z upside his head and tell him to leave. Okay? But when you want something, it looks at it a little different. So we understand the difference between wants and needs, right? I want to show you something that I think is going to change your life. You guys ready for that? Ready? <coughs> Everything that you believe, everything that you believe shows up in your results. Everything. What are our needs? I'll ask a really easy question. Our needs are love, to live, significance, and variety. Okay? And if you look to the next thing, this thing called a belief window. And our belief window captures everything that we do to be able to, under, to, make, to communicate our needs. For example, if I have a need, if I have a need for survival, that's based on some occurrence that happened to me, okay? So if that set of circumstances comes before me, then I'll have a behavior, and that behavior is going to be a protective environment. <coughs> so I'm going to protect myself. And the results are going to be I'm going to stay away from that, okay? A short story to be able to let everybody understand how this works out is that when I was a, when, uh, who had a dog when they were a kid? Who had a dog? Can you, can you tell me about your dog? Yes, you can, because I don't have much time. So you a volunteer. Let's go. You ready? Okay, what was his what was his name? Golda. What was his name? Golda. Golda. <laughs> I like that. So every time you came home from school, and everybody helped me with this, what need did you did she provide for you? Love. Love, right? Right? And that was based on the experience that whenever you came home from school, right? Golda? Golda was there, right? So if you saw Golda, what was your behavior? You would, what would, and what would you do? Behavior, ING things. Oh, I'd pet her. Start petting the dog, right? What, what would you do with your dog? Petting, holding, laughing, playing, right? So what was the result of that? What was the result? Happy? Happiness, right? Let's say it's happiness. I had a dog. My dog's name was, was Tiempo, OK? Yeah. Tiempo, Tiempo gave me love. But one day he bit me, <laughs> and it hurt. I, it was a bad deal. I mean, I was bleeding, all kind of stuff. So, so actually, if I see a dog now, what do you think my behavior is? Run, all that kind of stuff, right? 
So what do you think the result is? Not being bent, but if it's a TV show. It starts with an S, S-U-R, survivor, right? I survived. So if we're walking down the street and you see a dog, you think we're going to have different reactions to it? OK, because my reaction is, I want to live. <laughs> right? And I believe if I see a dog, then, then my behavior is to run from the dog, OK? And the results is survival. And the reason why this is so important for you is because this is visible. Everything I can see about change exists on this side. You can't look at me and tell me that you're afraid of a dog. You just can't do that. There's no way you would know that, right? But you can tell by my what? By my behavior, right? It's invisible where the experiences come from. Everybody get that? Is that making sense? Perhaps the most important instrument we have in helping us, our employees is navigating change of ourselves. When I look at the belief window, what it tells me <coughs> is that if I run into a situation with employees that I'm not familiar with, for example, I ran a, I ran a steak and ale in uh, Montrose area. Montrose at that time, and probably it, it may be one of the largest gay communities in the United States. Actually, it was the second largest at the time behind the one in San Francisco. And a lot of people did not want to work in that restaurant. They did not want to work in a restaurant. But what I decided to do is I wanted to make a name for myself, so I took that position. Well, when I took that position, one of the things I had to do was to change my belief windows about gay people. And if I didn't do that, I wouldn't survive in that environment. So I had to change my experiences, what I believed. And how do you go about doing those things? You get up close and personal, and you find allies, and you get people that you can support that can help you understand about the gay community. I went to gay clubs. I learned how to dance, finally. <laughs> it was very rewarding to me personally, because that store went from losing about $7,000 a month to making $28,000 a month okay, in about a six-month period of time. And it taught me a lesson that no matter what I may think about something, it's my work to be done to correct what I think, not their work. Everybody got that? Can I get an amen? amen. Staying in the moment is another concept I want you to think about. You know, you ever go, you ever rush out of your house and you're looking for your keys, you can't find your keys, and you can't find your car because you get, you're not in the moment. Being in the moment means that at that very time when you're in existence, you pay attention, close attention to the things that are going around you, going on around you. It particularly is useful when you're dealing with employees, and the employee may come up to you and they may feel that they're sick or, or they may have some personal issues, and you may just go right past them and miss an opportunity of connection. Staying in the moment means that I am with you and you are with me. We measure, we, <clears throat> we do our management measurements in, in the present and how we influence and how we contact people. The present piece is always, <clears throat> excuse me, in managing in the presence is just that part about staying in the moment and how we influence people, the communications, getting to know people as individuals are very, very important. I can't tell you the mistakes that I've seen in terms of managing people who've decided that they were more important than the person that they talked to, that they're talking to. Has it ever happened to you guys? Okay? And what does that leave you? It leaves you with a feeling that you didn't connect with that person and that you didn't have the value that you know you do have. And that's very important for us never to have. And then the contact. Back in the old days, you used to talk, take one of your employees and give them a big old hug and make them feel real good. Now that's called harassment, okay? which is not a good thing. But it's not harassment if it's love. And I always use the mama rule. Anything that you would do with your mom, it's OK to do with another woman, OK? Pretty simple, right? You don't need a big textbook to stick talking about harassment. I'm running low on my time. Oh, my god. You want me to give the phone? No. <laughs> you can't do that, can you? Dorothy, you're powerful. All oh, hell to the great and powerful Dorothy Nicholson. She's right on. And you know, it was so cool to know Dorothy when we were, it wasn't that long ago, was it? 
No, it wasn't. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> You've weathered the storm better than me. You were at the top, I was at the poop deck. It was just, it's a different world. <clears throat> One of the things, too, when you get into corporations, you got to remember something, and this is something I want to share with everyone. You're, you are good. That's why you're here. You're getting better at the university. You're going to get your first job. They're going to give you tasks to do, and you're going to be superior at those tasks. And then you get promoted to management. And one of the things about management that you all, people always forget is that now you get evaluated by the people who work for you. Oh, no. Well, you know, I told them to do that. They just didn't do it. Or well, their standards. I don't know what happens to the standards. Well, I'm not here. They don't work the same way. In our industry, that's not the case. You're always evaluated. And the other thing is they write your evaluations every single day. So keep that in your perspective. As I said before, take the toughest assignments. If you take the toughest assignments, that's going to get, that's going to get you a notice. So if there's a, there's a key area, once you understand your job, your responsibilities, your role, when you get to that point, when you want to take something tough that no one else does, it separates you from everyone else. You need to learn to balance, too. Balance is very important for me. I was not good at balance. I'm still not the way I want to be on that. But living and working and understanding your, your personal spirit is something that I'm growing to understand a lot more. Because the work ethic of working really hard and, and, and working from, from uh, 7 o'clock in the morning to, to midnight at night is something my generation was really good at. And we thought that that was the most important thing. But there's some Gen Xs out here, right? <coughs> Think you're crazy to do that. Why would training need to be five weeks when you can learn it in three? Right? You guys see it that way. And me, as an old timer, I'm starting to understand that myself. Why do we do that? And we don't have an answer. So change it. Help us with that. We can't figure that piece out. We made our training for everyone. We didn't make it for individuals. So when you go out into that world, tell them there was a big old guy from, university, from the University of Houston who graduated and said, we don't need to do training for five weeks. We can save money, productivity, and we're Generation Xers, and we know how to do it. You want me to write your note? <laughs> Excuse me, I'll take some water. Okay, I think I'm running pretty close. Let me do my let me do my clothes. I'm sorry, I want to be here with you guys. You guys having fun? Yeah. You learning something? Good. I get paid? No. <laughs> I got. I have to talk about the slide real quick. Same thing we all did. Oh my goodness, we're going to the bank. Yay. Um, Protect with reckless, reckless abandonment your people from discrimination and sexual harassment. What it does, when someone tells you that I'm discriminated against, it has, and are being harassed, sexually harassed, it meets a certain criteria. The victims lose goods, services, and opportunities. That could be salaries, it could be promotions, that could be self respect. Okay? That's the criteria. So when, so when someone says that, that they've been discriminated against, you're telling that person you're not as good as I am. And that is a painful truth that we need to change. So can I get your support in doing that? When you go to your jobs, you interrupt that behavior. You tell people when it's wrong. Because if they do it against an older person who might be an African American, who might be cleaning, cleaning, um, um, uh, making beds, and they're going to do it to a very young person also. Because it's, when it's done to one person, it's really done to everyone. So can you change that for me? And that's my, my generation people, too. We, we're the worst. Except for Dr. Paul. Give for the sake of giving rather than gaining. And my final closing thoughts. <laughs> Find a mentor. Find someone who you want to mentor. And it, what it does is it teaches you how to be mentored yourself. Talking about your industry to people who are very young is an important thing. We want, to, we want more people to understand this industry. The only way to be able to do that is to go out and tell people about the industry. So if you're not going back to your high school and talking to, talking to them about this school, they're not going to know the happiness that you're going to have in the future in terms of being a graduate from the school. Cherish this time. Cherish this time in your life your college, your friendships, and your professors. There are some professors here that, that will, will be in my heart forever. 
and then find ways to give your resources to the school also. This school, you know, I, when, I, when I was coming up, we always heard about this little rest company, I mean, a red, uh, school called Cornell University and how nice they were and how smart they were and all that kind of BS. <laughs> we changed that perception, we changed that paradigm by graduating and knowing that we have goals to hit and making sure that you know that's important for all of us. Because when you, someone says that you went to the University of Houston, then the Conrad in Houston, Houston School of Hotel and Restaurant Management, you want to be able to say, now and in the future and forever, that this is the best school in the country. And it took me a long time to be a vice president. It took forever, okay? I don't expect it to take you guys that long, okay? Go out. It's more fun than you believe. <coughs> it's more fun. I've met uh, two presidents now. I've um, Evander Holyfield, somebody I really like a lot. Um, Doug Williams is a Super Bowl quarterback, first African-American Super Bowl quarterback. He's a good friend of mine. But that's not the most important thing. It's the thousands of people that I come into contact with that know that I care deeply for them as individuals. <coughs> that because I'm a restaurant person and I believe this business and I love this business, that it makes me a special person too. And I can tell you all the times that we work really hard and we stay there late at night to those places and you don't think you're appreciated. Remember, you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for yourself. Because that type of work is its own reward. And your reward is being the best person on earth. Because remember, when there's storms and all of the um, atrocities that go on. Where do people go when there's a storm? They go to restaurants, right? They go to hotels. You know why? Because we don't know what's going on outside because we're working, okay? And we, do, we believe always in terms of taking care of everybody for lots of different reasons. But it's who we are. And I love this business. I love the career it's made for me. I love the opportunity of being with people like yourself. And I can tell you that you've chosen the most honorable, the most rewarding, and the most satisfying jobs ever created. I think it's the second oldest profession. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, and with that, I want to tell you thank you very much for the privilege and honor of coming and speaking with you before today. I, 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 it's almost a tear when it comes to my eyes because I see so much hope and determination and beauty and, and understanding. and. You guys, so you, you just look, need to look at yourselves. You, you're fine. <laughs> you rock. And I thank you so much for having the opportunity to be for the talk. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. That's more than I thought I had. Any questions? First person gets free dinner at Outback Steakhouse. Wow. <laughs> there we go. No, I mean, how did you do it in college? Though? How long did it take you? Okay, I'm not supposed to answer that question. In the old days, <laughs> in the old days, you could take a lot of hours at one time. I mean, I, I've taken 22 hours at one time. And I worked at night. Remember, 11 o'clock at night, 7 o'clock in the morning? I was crazy. I was young and I was crazy. Uh, I went to Jenny College for two years. I got a degree um, there. Uh, some of the hours transferred, some of it didn't. I just came back from the military. I didn't want to be one of these military people who spent 10 years to get through college. I wanted to do it in two years. So I went through all the semesters, all the summer semesters. Took 117 hours in two years. I'm a man, man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I love the hotel people. I mean, I stay in hotels all the time. <laughs> you guys are tough. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a different, it's a different skill set. I, I'm a, I need to have immediate gratification in terms of someone coming in my restaurant, making them happy, and getting them out. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got another seat over here. I need to make some money. So that's what my. But I, when I would work, and I, and I remember um, uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Wilson, 
who was one of the managers. I would get off at 7 o'clock in the morning, and she would come to work, and I would get there at 11 o'clock, and she would still be at work. And I thought I couldn't do that. But it's changed now over the years. And I can tell you, that with, the, um, with the advent of, of people understanding the jobs because of professional institutions like, the, like our school here, uh, the efficiencies of being a, ho of a hotel manager is completely different. There's a lot more expertise. And I think during this time, I probably would have made a commitment to, to go into hotels. But the restaurant just seemed so appealing to me at the time. Yes, ma'am? <coughs> It all depends, <clears throat> and it's truly one of those things that's up to your own ability. Um, I can tell you, at every company I worked at, I was um, usually people say three to four years. I was um, always promoted to uh, general manager within uh, 18 months at the very at that, that time period. <coughs> okay, but you gotta you gotta put out. You know, people, you have to be the obvious choice. When I say that, that's a reality. People need to say, you know, you gotta watch that Joseph guy over there. You know, he's working harder, he's doing everything, he's asking questions. You know, you have to be obnoxious sometimes to be able to get ahead. Because people, you want people to know that they got to tell you the answer. People just don't walk up to you and say, okay, here's all the keys to the business. I'm going to give them to you, and you know what? You're going to be a manager in 18 months. You know, and that's wonderful. Don't be happy. No, that don't happen. That never happened. What happens is you got to drag, kick, scream, holler, and say, you know what? I want this. I want this more than the person next to me. You have to be competitive. But it's not competitive like you want to put someone down. It's competitive with yourself. Yes, sir. Well, we somebody. Go ahead. When you came in executive, uh, what were some of the new challenges that you had to face? I have to be very honest. Somebody my color, it's different. You know, people look at you and, you know, can he? Does he know what polysyllabic connotations are? Big words, right? Can he articulate himself in situations involving corporate people, politicians, national leaders? People who didn't look like me never have to have those questions, so I find myself having to be qualified. I'd have to qualify myself in terms of my abilities more than I thought I needed to. But it was worth it because other people, younger people, people who look like me, won't have to go through the same thing. So that's part of it is going to be important. So those are the challenges. The other challenges is it's easier than people make it. <laughs> Being a vice president is the easiest job I've ever had. Is the camera on? <laughs> make sure you cut that piece before it goes in my company. It is because you, I used to get headaches, now I give headaches. <laughs> I, my role. <laughs> Yeah, right? My role is to make people happy. And the ones you want to concentrate on making happy, and to answer your question, is the people who are under you. If you get those folks happy, the ones above you are going to respect you, not the other way around. Okay? And the people underneath you will see if you belong, your allegiance is up or if it goes down. If it goes down, it will support you and make you uh, get promoted. Answer your question. One more question. <laughs> no, we were tired, huh? <laughs> yes, ma'am. What would be um, advice for people who want to be in a different The first thing is go to Hank's Ice Cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And the reason why I say that is because you will see that Hank, with very limited skills and abilities, has built a, built a reputation. In that area, you go to anybody in the medical center, they will tell you that they eat ice cream and they know it's bad for them, but they eat it because ice cream is wonderful. <laughs> and what you'd want to do is you want to be able to get around entrepreneurs and talk to them about the successes, their fears, the, you know, the risks that it takes. But there's a lot of rewards in that also, in the rewards of being able to control your own future. And when you can control your own future, you know, you name the ticket that you want and you go wherever you want. And that's a wonderful feeling. So the challenges are, they're in all the, all the books, you can read about them, but the best thing to do is to find an entrepreneur, talk to them about their successes, and then get interested in some of the things that, that strike your imagination, the things that you pull energy from, and investigate it. But you can do it. Do you own a place? Did I own a place? Yes, I own an Outback Steakhouse in San Antonio, Texas. You own it. Owned it. That's different, isn't it? Yeah, it was different. Yeah, it was. 
especially when uh, they put a they, I, I knew that a couple of years, but well, right before I got promoted, my sales were like seventy thousand a week, and then they put a highway in front of it. So now the, I got promoted, and now the sales are fifty thousand. So if I'd have been there, I'd been hurting. I'd probably be saying something different about entrepreneurship, but it runs both ways. You can make a lot of money, but you you're living off the land. Thank you very much. That was an outstanding speech, Joseph. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I gather from uh, the applause everyone else did too. Um, I three um, professors always say more and more about less and less. And uh, as a professor emeritus, I three things, if I'm allowed this, and then a couple more things. But um, I don't know what Joseph would say today. Uh, <coughs> classes were a lot smaller then, and I, you could walk up to a student very easily and push the button on the recorder. In a classroom like this, what I used to do, Joseph, if someone fell asleep, I learned it from an Aggie. I threw racquetballs, <laughs> and, and that kept them fairly alert. Um, in terms of uh, looking the same as I always have, when anybody, anybody tells me that I haven't changed, I always say to them, well, you must have thought I was old before I was ever young. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> and finally, to tie into we do what we do, there's a, a rock group that's one of the best that's ever existed. There's a movie now called Shine a Light by Martin Scorsese. And the song ties into what you said a little bit. You can't always get what you want, but if you try real hard, you get what you need. So I, I think that follows up on you, but I can't play the song How or cool sing it for that? you. Dr. Rafal, that's a good no. one. Give him a hand. That's <laughs> anyway, Joseph, if, you, if you'd be kind enough to come back up. We do have a plaque for you. If I may read this, it's the Conrad and Hilton College, University of Houston, Joseph L. Jackson, the Eric Hilton Distinguished Chair Alumni Series, April 10th, 2008, signed by our Dean John Bowen, and yours truly. Congratulations and thank you for being here. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Don't cry. Just stand right here for a second. Something's supposed to happen. <laughs> Don't look. You're not supposed to I put to my look. depends on. Is something supposed to happen? <laughs> uh, of course, you believe in team building, don't you? I do believe in team and building. Do you, do you trust me? Yes, sir. Okay, move back just a little bit. <laughs> now, now sit down. <laughs> oh, it's a chair. Oh, it's a sweet thing, a chair. You look pretty good in that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My very own chair. Uh, thank you all for, for this wonderful turnout. And if you have any questions, uh, to, uh, understand we do have a seminar this afternoon up close and personal with. Uh, with Mr. Joseph Jackson and his wife Suzanne, and if, if some of you would like to chat with him right now, we have a few, few more minutes. Thank you very much.